got to tell you something. Uh, God's been really good the whole time through, regardless of what we face, regardless of circumstances and trials you and I go through. God is always good. There are things that he wants us to learn, mind you. There are things that we, for whatever reason in his wisdom, and we're called to be faithful and to trust, but for whatever reason, we are called to trust in him, you know, regardless of the circumstances. God has a plan. He's working in, on our lives, working in us and through us so that ultimately this may happen. Not that we may recognize how amazing and great he is, although he is, amen? But he doesn't do it for that reason. He simply does it because he just loves us. He just wants to look after us and and he wants us to enjoy not only uh, eternal life with him, but to experience victory in him today. What do you guys say to that? That's the truth. I've got to tell you something. A lot of interesting stuff going around, going around at the moment. Uh, we're finding uh, people investing their time and money into all sorts of interesting, different things. I don't know if you've been reading um, some of the latest uh, scientific research is, that's, bringing, um, that's getting our attention these days. It has a lot to do with prolonging life. A lot of people have a desire to live forever, Right? Yes, it's obvious. Like, be honest for a second. Who here wants to live forever? Be honest. Who would love to live? Nobody. I just, if I could die tomorrow, it would be fantastic. <laughs> uh, come on. Everyone wants to live forever. If you could live forever, you'd say, yes, I would live forever. And there's nothing wrong with that. And don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed about that. You know, this guy is a picture of a guy here on the screen, Elon Musk. He has invested a lot of money in working out a way to, to live forever, in perhaps freezing his body that one day when technology will finally catch up, they can unfreeze him. He's thinking about perhaps sending his body into space that somehow after it does a full, I don't know, orbit of the universe, he'll come back and he'll still be alive whilst everyone else has perhaps moved thousands of years. But all of this stuff might sound a little crazy to you, doesn't it? It's like, whatever, did you know? In China today, they have successfully increased the life of a mouse by 25% by messing around with their DNA. Did you know that? They've worked out, it's true, look it up, Google it. They've worked out a way to increase the life of a mouse by 25%, y'all. And there's nothing wrong with the mouse. It behaves exactly the same way. It hasn't lost its taste for cheese. 25%. The entire world, including me, I'm going to be honest with you this morning, the entire, I believe, almost every single person except for 50% of the people here at Adventist Fellowship this morning wants to live forever. And I don't understand why people who do not believe in God have this desire to live forever. If there is no meaning and reason to life, then why live forever? I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says to us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 11, check this out. You can look it up yourselves, that God has placed eternity into our hearts. Did you know that? Naturally, you and I desire to live forever. It's a natural thing. We were never designed or created to live for a moment and then pass away. We were never created designed to be separated from the people we love. We were meant to live with the people we love forever. And so as we look into science a little this morning, we're going to be doing some talking about some monkey business with you all. Is that okay? A bit of monkey business. I want you guys to be patient as we have a look at something that is truly, and I believe with all my heart, is the reason as to why society is falling apart and people are hurting so much. There is something that is happening and taking place. There is a philosophy, an idea, perhaps even a religion, that has perhaps superseded every other. And as a result, we find ourselves in the mess that we find ourselves in today. I want to welcome those who are watching online and watching on TV. Thank you for joining us. You need to stay connected with us. Send us a message and let us know that you are here with us this morning. Just a simple hi on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, wherever you are. And if you're watching on CW, please write to us at hello at adventistfellowship.org and we'd love to connect with you. Let's have a word of prayer together. Our Father in heaven, 
Lord, we pause for a moment to acknowledge that you are here with us. Personally, Lord, individually, Father, we have so much to be thankful for. At the same time, we don't understand everything, but we're so thankful, Lord, for you. That the little we understand, Father, we find peace and happiness within it. And we find the strength and capacity to move on every single day, knowing that you're in control, that you love us, that you cared for us. You care for us and you died for us, Lord. So, Father, we invite your Holy Spirit into this place. As we spend the next few moments debunking, having a look at the very lies that perhaps the enemy, Lord, at least a number of people have brought to us here on earth today that is ruining society, families, and friendships. Lord, I pray that we may please expose some of these things for your glory. But, Father, that we may be liberated. We may find freedom in truth. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. What you all say? Amen. Amen. Elon Musk. Now, most of you guys know this guy, know this character. He's a South African-born, Canadian-American business magnate, inventor, investor, engineer. He is the founder, CEO, CTO of SpaceX, a co-founder, Series A investor, CEO, and product architect of Tesla Inc., Don't know why you didn't come to Tulsa, by the way. We should talk about that someday. Co-chairman of OpenAI, the founder and CEO of Neuralink. He was previously co-founder and chairman of SolarCity, co-founder of Zip2. Some of you are like, what? Doesn't matter. Founder of X.com. Still don't understand. The guys that put together PayPal. All right, got somewhere. At some point in time, I can't remember, a few years ago, his net worth was something like... a little bit more than I have in my account forever. (laughs) $14 billion. Would you say he's a smart guy? Oh, come on. Yes, be honest. Just admit it. This guy's a very intelligent man. And when you ask him about life, its origins, what this is all about, where we're headed, what's going on, this is what he has to say. Are you interested? He says, And this is a direct quote. If you think the language is a little bit funny, it's perhaps South African, I don't understand. But listen, there's a one in billions chance we are in base reality. And for some of those of you who are going, I have no idea what he just said, let me explain. He says there is one in a billion chance that you and I are actually living the reality that you and I are living today. What? What? One in a billion chance that you and I are actually living in the reality that you and I are living in today? Please explain, sir. He goes on. In fact, there's one to billions chance that we are not living in a simulator. What Alan Mars is actually saying here is that he believes, this guy Alan actually believes that you and I are in fact living in a simulation. What you see, what you look at, what you experience are simply numbers made up of lots of zeros, lots of ones, and a few more zeros, and lots of ones. This ain't real. There is something greater. There is something more intelligent that is masterminding, that is organizing and developing the very images that you and I process through our brains and through our eyes. This is what he believes. And therefore, there must be i.e. an intelligent mastermind behind it all, says the atheist who completely believes utterly in evolution. Isn't that interesting? Whereas the rest of his colleagues, and in fact the very science labs he funds, says otherwise, says that you and I come from nowhere. You may not know this guy, his name is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Did you know anybody heard of this guy before? Okay, you do know him. That's great. Very good. He's an American astrophysicist. He's an author, science communicator. And he's done a lot of amazing things, by the way. He has an incredible uh, uh, track record in this evolution scientific world, in fact. 
And here, he is, here is exactly what he has to say about our beginnings, about what this is all about. He says this, I think the likelihood may be very high, he said, and this is what the magazine writes about him. He noted the gap between human and chimpanzee intelligence, despite the fact that we share more than 98% of our DNA. He says, somewhere out there could be a being whose intelligence is that much greater than ours, says an atheist who believes in evolution. Check this out. He says, we would be drooling, blithering idiots in their presence, he said. If that's the case, it is easy for me to imagine that everything in our lives is just a creation of some other entity for their entertainment. Scientific America, 7th of April. Isn't that interesting? Some of the greatest, most intelligent minds when pushed in a corner about, please explain why you believe in in evolution, why there isn't a God, will never confess to God, but believes that there must be something greater, something more intelligent than what you and I can fathom. Isn't that interesting? I'm gonna ask you a question. Why do we find ourselves in a society where morality, right, and wrong is simply decided by the majority. Why do we find ourselves in a society where right and wrong is no longer absolute, but simply dependent on popular opinion? Do you wanna know the answer? I believe that the answer is simply because of one particular religion that is accepted taught and promoted as truth, as fact, as a reality. A religion so influential that it has shaped the moral basis for society throughout the entire Western world. A religion that is so powerful that it is endorsed as infallible and beyond doubt by world governments, by media, and by schools across the globe today. What is this religion, you may ask? Well, it is not Christianity. It's not one of the major world religions either. It's not Islam. It's not Buddhism, it's not Hinduism, it is not Judaism. Would you like to hear what one of the leaders of this religion has to say about itself? Who would like to see exactly what one of the leaders of this religion has to say about itself? Check it, I'm gonna share with you anyway. Professor Michael Roos, some of you may know him from Florida State University, he has incredible credentials. Check this out, he says evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a, what? A secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality, he thinks. I am an ardent evolutionist, an ex-Christian, he goes on to say, but I must admit, evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it is true of evolution still today. Michael Ruse has received three honorary doctorates in the last 20 years for his contribution to science and especially evolution. The question you're asking right now, is fairly obvious. Why does he believe, or why does he call evolution a religion? Well, I am a little bit surprised too, if you are. Because up to this point, from everything that I've learned in school, college, wherever, at home, the books that I read, I thought evolution was science. Did I miss something? Maybe Michael Roos lost the plot. Maybe he's smoking something. Now I wanna look into this question. I need to unpack this a little with you. And the other thing I need to look at is how does evolution eventually lead people to hopelessness? And this is a claim that I'm making and I'm gonna share this with you here this morning. Let's start with the first question. Why does Michael believe that evolution is a religion? I'm gonna start with this man. About 160 years plus ago, something like that, 
I didn't do the math. Larry can help out later. In about 1859, Charles Robert Darwin, 1859, by the way, published his landmark book, The Origin of Species. 1859, that's a long time ago, y'all. Jackson, were you, were you around then? Just curious. I don't know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, no, 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 you weren't. Oh, you, you're sure you weren't. Okay, good. Yeah, I just thought maybe you were. I mean, you know, what's with age, by the way? You meant to get wiser with age and all that kind of stuff. That's why I just assumed you were around back in 1859, but, but not for everybody. Um, a good friend of mine had a birthday recently. He turned 40, but I honestly, most of us think he looks like he's in his 60s. Uh, I, I don't want, I mean, I'm just being honest with you. You, you. The age does stuff to people. We tend to twist and forget and, and organize things in interesting ways. That's what age does. But JB, oh, I didn't want to say your name, but okay, JB is the guy I'm referring to. JB turned 40 and, uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding, JB, you don't, you don't look 60. I would say not a day over 50 at least maximum, not a day over. JB is getting wiser and uh, we spend some time together, a lot of time together, we play a bit of sport and his age definitely shows it. But with age comes consequences, things change. Oh, that was a dig and a half. Um, he doesn't know where I live, we're safe. <laughs> 1859, this is a while ago, 160 plus years ago, Charles Darwin comes up with an incredible theory, one that changes the world and will change and continue to change the world until Christ returns. And for whatever reason back then, he didn't have as much, if you like, opposition as he does today, but, but for whatever reason in time, we have decided and agreed that this would foremost, his theories, his ideology, and what I'm about to share with you about his main principles would be more acceptable in society with our reasoning within our schools and what you and I tend to believe. And let me tell you something, friends. The reason why I am expressing an urgency in my voice on this matter is because as it was true in Bible times, as Paul will write to the early Christians, it is true today, that what the world believes and what the world teaches does impact the Christian walk. And you can think about that for a second, and how many ideas perhaps that have come from theories of evolution have crept into your understanding of God and creation. And in fact, perhaps is dividing churches across the globe, across denominations today. You must listen, we must understand something because it impacts our Christianity and it's time we expose what this evolution truly is all about. So he proposed these new teachings and he says, number one, on the origins of species, all time, matter and space exist as a result of of the Big Bang 15 billion years ago. Number two, on life, he teaches all life evolved from inorganic chemicals forming single cell organisms. Number three, on development, single celled organisms develop into complex life forms through natural selection, AKA survival of the fittest. Number four, regarding genetics. He teaches nearest and most likely relative is the chimpanzee. And now almost every school and university on the face of this planet teaches that this, these concepts, these ideas, these theories, if you like, is in fact science. We are taught that evolution is more than just a theory. That is, is it is in fact science, right? So where does Michael Ruse, that professor we talked about a little bit earlier, where does Michael Ruse get the nerve to call evolution a religion? Now to clear up the confusion, we need to understand exactly what the meaning of science is, because things change with time, people change with time, like JB, as I explained, and so it so does words, and so does our language. Like for example, back in the days when I was at school, this word meant cool, right? Wicked was like, wicked, that is so wicked, man. You guys use that, right? It meant like it was a good thing, it was a positive thing. It wasn't evil or witchcraft, it was positive. Back in my parents' days, gay meant happy. If someone was feeling gay, he was feeling happy with himself or with herself, right? 
I remember when I was in primary school many years ago, I would go to the uh, milk bar. Do you guys have milk bars here? I don't even know what, you, what word to give it here in America. It's a place where they sell confectionery and we ice cream and snacks on the corner on the side of a road. Uh, corner store, here we go. We call them milk bars back then. And I would go in, into a milk bar and my favorite ice cream was Golden Gay Time. And I would always buy a Golden Gay Time ice cream. Google it, it's a popular ice cream in Australia. And back then it didn't mean much but a golden fun time. Today, if I say I want a Golden Gay Time, it might mean something else, right? And so science, by the way, has its own definition that perhaps we have changed a little bit over time. Over time, we have changed the way that it is understood. But this is, in fact, the most correct definition or description of what science is from the Collins Dictionary 2003. Are you ready? Science is the study of the nature and behavior of the material and physical universe. Are you ready? Based on observation experiment, and measurement. Listen up, y'all. Science, for it to be a scientific experiment, to qualify as science, you need to have these basic ingredients all put together. And the key ingredients will make for you a beautiful Indian vindaloo, right? If you tried one of those chicken vindaloo, it is truly amazing. In order for you to taste the authentic, the original, perfect chicken vindaloo, there are certain ingredients which you must put in there for it to be chicken vindaloo. For it to be science, there must be these three important elements. Without it, it cannot be science. You must have observation, you must have experiment, and you must have measurements. You guys with me? Let us go back to the Big Bang. Do you remember the Big Bang? Everything, he said, time, matter, space, came from, came from the Big Bang, 15 billion years ago. Now what kind of a question would a good science student ask about a statement like that, you think? I'd imagine it'd be a question like this. For example, excuse me, sir, who made the Big Bang? That would be an intelligent question. What started the Big Bang? These are great questions. Or what was there before the Big Bang? Why don't we ask, a, well, why don't we ask science to answer that question for us? Here's what science says about what there was before the Big Bang. Are you ready? Nothing. Before a Big Bang was nothing. The well-known physics professor Paul Davies, super well-respected, confirms that before the Big Bang, there was absolutely nothing, nada, niet, rien. There was nothing. And a good science student wouldn't end there. In fact, we would ask the question, you need to please explain yourself. Please help us understand what you mean by nothing. And here is how this would be answered. The science says, everything, in fact, everything came from nothing. So we ask the following questions. For it to be scientific, do you remember the, uh, the, the elements, the ingredients to make that vindaloo? For it to be scientific, we, we, we have to confirm that it is based on, at least it meets the requirements, that something can be observable, right? Experimented on and it can be measured. That's what science, in fact, is. My wife is studying teaching at the moment, and she's doing a degree in teaching for primary school kids, by the way, not university kids, and she's opening up her, uh, her, her uh, book that she's referencing um, what she needs to be tested on eventually. This science book, it's called The Art of Teaching Primary Science. It's very obvious what it's doing there. And in the second page as you open it, it's definition of science. Here's what it says. Understand that scientists think about problems and develop theories that make predictions that can be 
tested. Not much has changed. Understand that scientific theories are tested, changed and retested until every conceivable objection has been dealt with. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to include a fifth requirement for whatever needs to be used to test whether something is scientific or not. Number one, it has to be something that you can observe. Number two, it has to be something that you can replicate in a laboratory. Number three, it has to be something you can measure using known paradigms. Number four, it has to be something that will allow you to predict and test future reactions. And we've chucked in a number five in there. We've snuck one in. Number five, there must be no conceivable objections left. Evolution says that something or everything comes from, comes from nothing. Excuse me, I have a question. When was the last time you observed something or everything coming out of nothing? I'm just asking. I know this is quite stupid and ignorant, perhaps and naive, but it's a very good question. Number two, when was the last time you actually experimented with this? Number three, how about measuring how long it took you to make something or everything out of nothing? It's the same kind of stuff that we do to ourselves before an exam. We, we don't study and we expect to know everything. <laughs> when does that work? It's like putting money in the bank and praying that suddenly a few million dollars will turn up out of the three dollars that you put in there. How does that happen? When did that ever happen? Number four, what about predicting the future? Or what will happen when you make something out of nothing? Because the basic first tenet of evolution cannot be observed, cannot be experimented with, tested, used to make predictions, and still has many conceivable objections. Therefore, friends... Tulsa, listen up. I know I'm having a bit of fun with you this morning, but it is serious. Because this ain't so scientific at all. It is creeping into our churches and it is creeping into the lives of our children, of our friends and neighbors and people we dearly love without understanding what it brings them to and where it takes them to. We must expose what this ideology and what this theory teaches. Friends, evolution is not science. So as we define evolution, as we looked at everything that it is, what word shall we give it? What definition probably explains what it truly is, therefore? Well, check this out. Tell me if you like this one. Strong, this is from the Collins Dictionary again. Strong or unshakable belief in something, especially without proof or evidence. Friends, do you believe that this sounds a bit more like evolution? Absolutely. Do you know what we call this, by the way? We call this faith. Faith. You're intelligent people. I know you guys. Does the word faith belong in science or in religion? Evolution is not science. Evolution is a religion. And Michael Ruse was correct. So here's the other bit that I want to tell you this morning. It actually leads people, our family and our friends, to hopelessness. And obviously the question is, how? Well, do you remember the second and third ideas evolution taught us? All life evolved from inorganic chemicals forming single cell organisms, slime, right? Number two, single cell organisms develop into complex life and forms uh, through natural selection, aka survival of the, of the fittest. In other words, survival in the evolutionary world is based on your fitness level. There is only one law in evolution, and that is fight for survival. Survive, perhaps you've heard this before, survive at all costs. In a live debate many years ago, the world-famous evolutionist Richard Dawkins, does that name ring a bell? Someone say yes. 
Richard Dawkins was challenged with the following question from another intelligent author. And he says, and this is what he says, John Lanier, he says, Mr. Dawkins, there's a large group of people who simply are uncomfortable with accepting evolution because it leads to what they perceive as a moral vacuum in which their best impulses have no basis in nature. And Richard Dawkins hears and accepts this comment, but in response, here's what he says. Sir, all I can say is, that's just tough. We have to face up to the truth. All I can say is, that's just tough. What is truth? That there is no morality? That there is no right? That there is no wrong? That the truth is survival of the fittest? He doesn't end there. Dawkins continues and he says this, you are for nothing. You are here to propagate your selfish genes. There is no higher purpose to your life. As a follower or believer in evolution, if you like, what answers do you have to how we got here? Where, why are we here? Who we are and where are we going? I wanna help you and answer that question. Now I'm saying this with care, with certainty, with love. We came from nothing. Why are we here? Good luck, or bad luck, depending on your situation. Chance, who are we? We are overgrown, evolved, developing slime with no intrinsic value except the ones that we give to ourselves and except the ones that we give to each other. With this understanding, men like Hitler, Pol Pot and Stalin felt that there was just too much overdeveloped, evolved slime in their part of the world and so decided to exterminate millions of overgrown monkeys. One of the perhaps best way to summarize experiencing a life in evolution or believing in this evolution religion is found in someone who ideally lived it to the fullest. Just before his execution in 1994, Jeffrey Dahmer, convicted of 17 murders, told Stone Phillips of Dateline NBC the following, if a person doesn't think that there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? I always believed the theory of evolution as truth that we all just came from the slime. When we died, you know, that was it. There is nothing more. No wonder, as, as you read the news and watch the news, you find that a 13-year-old can kill her teacher and not feel a thing about it. No wonder people try to take their own lives without a second thought. No wonder we are able to bomb people without thinking twice. Or why no wonder nursing homes are, are full of elderly people that never get a visit from family or any friends. Why bother? If, if religion tells you that you are nothing, that you are here for no reason, going nowhere, why bother? Why not just live out the most selfish, destructive life you can? Why not just do it and forget about what is right and wrong, about consequences, about your feelings, friendships, about anything else and about anyone else? A famous Australian author, writes the following as he processes what extreme the extremes that, that evolution takes society. And he writes, the average young, and I put in there American, who believes what he is taught, believes the evolutionary dogma that he is only an animal who arrived by chance, lives by his wits, survives to, bre to breed and will die. The majority of ordinary folk accept this theory and live 
like animals. Many come to see the utter futility and stupidity of struggling to survive. So after they have tasted sex and every other thrill of a purely animal existence, they decide to opt out of life into the oblivion of drugs or suicide. Others go on living like animals. They satisfy every animal desire that wells up within them, he says. If they want sex, they have it immediately. If they feel aggressive, they show it immediately. They crunch, the crunch comes if they rape, harm, or kill. Then they fall foul of the law and are jailed and punished for being the animals that, were, that they were taught to be. As you consider my life, your own lives, you can see how a world postmodern secular ideology creeps in when we begin to behave selfishly, when we begin to hurt other people to satisfy whatever else is going on inside of us, Christians too are beginning to introduce some of these ideologies, these philosophies into their lives. Pastor Nick, enough. Enough. I get the point. What's the good news? What's the alternative? This is all about religion. What alternative do you and I have? In the last few weeks, as you've been spending some time with us, I have shown you and been trying to show you and I will continue to show you that the Bible is something that your source of truth that you and I can depend and rely on. Historically, archaeologically, and prophetically, the Bible has not failed you thus far and never will, I believe. The book of the Bible tells us, in fact, that you are, in terms of what God is as our designer and creator. <coughs> Excuse me. I told you I'd get excited. Check this out. The Bible says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were, in fact, created there is overwhelming evidence that shows that God is in fact creator and designer, the person who made everything and maintains everything, not only for his glory because he made it, but because he loves you and wants you to experience the wonders and the joys of his creation. It was made for you and all evidence shows exactly that. Let's talk about the missing link, if you like, just for a moment. I won't spend a lot of time there. You know, evolution teaches that there is a supposed missing link in the stage of evolution when it comes to man. There's a missing link from monkey to human. And let me tell you something. We have found a lot of fossils, haven't we? For decades, perhaps even 100 plus years, we've been digging the earth up and we have found a many fossils. And even some of these guys believe that some of these fossils are 100 million plus years old, whatever. But what they have never discovered up until today are those, is the fossils or remainings, or remains, if you like, of the missing link. And so news reporters, and they'll be uh, on social media and on TV and the newspapers from time to time, you'll see someone say, we found the missing link. But what you'll never see the next week is that it was a hoax. It was a mistake after they investigated. You look it up. Till today, no one has verified, clarified, or seen the evidence of a missing link. We can, we can talk about the lack of evidence when it comes to, to macro evolution. Because the reality is things only evolve within species. So we believe that there is microevolution, small evolutions that happen only within the same species. For example, when it comes to dogs, you have one breed breeding with another breed, and then you have a third breed. This is called microevolution because they are still within the same species. We have witnessed, we have seen, we have observed and measured. This is a fact. But what we have never seen till today is a dog becoming a cat or a cat becoming a dog. There is no evidence for macro evolution. You know, we've discovered some of the greatest things in the last century, DNA. Isn't that a wonderful science? So revolutionary that Dr. Francis Collins, director of Human Genome Project, had the following to say about DNA. 
I see DNA, the information molecule of all living things as God's language, as the elegant and complexity of our own bodies, as the rest of nature, as a reflection of God's plan. So convincing is the evidence in DNA for a, a, of a creator God that even the world's most famous atheist, Richard Dawkins, admits to this evidence. Do you want to see that? Pay attention to this for a second. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, and how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, no. No, no, no has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Anybody surprised? Guys, what Richard Dawkins is telling here is saying in this very interview, the most famous atheist evolution, if you like, to have ever lived. He's saying that he doesn't understand where things in fact came from, but he believes that it came from some place, someone intelligent outside of the realm that you and I live in. Man, we've been preaching and talking about this for the last few weeks. You need to know that there is someone outside, external from the mess that we call life, who has saved us and given us the opportunity to eternal life. Richard Dawkins turns around and he says, there must be something. There must be something, and perhaps he can call it an alien if you like, but he acknowledges as he looks at the evidence of DNA that there must be something intelligent that has made you. And therefore, if he has made you, he has not abandoned you. He has not forsaken you. He plans to bring you, to take you with him, to look after you, to take you home, to experience the eternity that he had planned for you. You better believe that. There is no other solution. There is no other ideology or theory that exists on this planet that has the best truth, in fact, that brings hope and life to people. And yes, you may say that, in fact, Pastor Nick, this is the reality. When you talk about Christianity or you talk about creation, it doesn't measure up with science either. I agree. It does measure up with science. But God has given us His Word. God has given us His Bible. And let me tell you something amazing about the Bible. You can test it out, friends. You can see, you can experience, you can experiment. You can test to see that it's true, that it is reliable. You can measure the Word of God. You can observe what happens as a result of accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can observe what happens to people's lives as they commit their life to Jesus. And you see that they do away with alcoholism, with drugs and all of their addictions. You can observe in the lives of people who testify that Jesus is living in them what happens happens as a result of that surrender to self. We do not have a blind faith, my dear brothers and sisters, you watching online. You do not have a blind faith in Jesus Christ. You can test, observe and measure through His Word that He is true, that He lives and He lives in us and through us. Amen. God gives us His beautiful creation as a result. And as we look at His amazing creation, and as we advance in science, we can only testify that there must be a design and therefore a designer. Richard Dawkins 
said so himself. So the real question therefore, friends, isn't whether or not evolution is scientific. The ultimate question that I have for you this morning, friends, is which religion will you therefore choose to follow? One that says that you are a piece of slime, that your parents are animals with no value. One that says that your children are overgrown slime, that you are nothing worth nothing going nowhere, that others have no value, that they are to be used and abused to ensure your survival, that life means nothing and death means nothing, that you should stop crying, in fact, when your friends or your loved ones commit suicide, or when your loved one has cancer, or when your partner leaves you. The choice is yours this morning. I beg you, is this the life, the religion that you want to follow, Tulsa? The eternity that you want? From nothing to nowhere and back to nothing again. Or will you choose the alternative, which the Bible says, His Word is the most reliable source of truth offered to you and me this morning and forevermore. What religion will you choose today? Thanks again for tuning in today. If we can pray for you or help you learn more about how Jesus can change your life, send us an email, hello at adventistfellowship.org. Also, we would love for you to join us in person. We meet at 11 a.m. every Saturday. To find out more and get directions, visit us online at adventistfellowship.org.